What's up, Freedom Church? How we feeling? My name is Justice. I'm the lead pastor. I want to say what's up to everybody. And will you just welcome with me everybody who's online today? A lot of people online. We got Arizona in the house, Texas, Ohio, Barstow, Houston, H-Town, where you at? Vermont. Somebody's from the SoFi Stadium. Okay, awesome. Um, and it's a big day. And also, everybody who's watching at the 1 p.m. service right now, uh, thank you so much for moving to the 1 p.m. You've helped us so much. Um, we had a record-breaking uh, last couple of Sundays in a row, and you moving to the 1 p.m. has opened up more space. We have uh, six seats open in this service, so <laughs> there we go. Are you guys excited about seeing people go public with their faith and get baptized today outside? Is that... That's just such an exciting moment. And we're also finishing our series called Jesus One-Liners. And this is one of the last things Jesus said to his disciples. And I want to give you a little context in Matthew chapter 28. He has reappeared after being publicly crucified on a cross in front of everybody. He is back from the dead. Anybody believe in a risen Savior? So Jesus is back from the dead, okay? And the disciples who saw this go down are now seeing Jesus in the flesh, all right? And one of them's like, I don't know, guys. I, I, I would have to actually see Jesus, put my hand inside of his, 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 his put my finger in his hand where the, where the nail went through. I'd have to touch his side. Jesus shows up, lets him do that. He eats with them. I mean, for 40 days, y'all, Jesus appeared to the disciples kept teaching the Bible, commissioned them to go into all the world. For 40 days, he was with them before he left. I mean, that's a long time to show yourself. Now, 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 at the very end of that time, Jesus gathers them, and he's about to ascend to heaven, right? And, and, and it says here in Matthew chapter 28 that they're all in Galilee, and they've, they've gathered before him, and you're going to love this. Verse 19, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. Because that's what happens when you realize Jesus is God. Amen? And, uh, 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 but some doubted. <laughs> but some doubted. These 11 guys, what happened to 12? I thought there was 12. What happened? What happened to that guy? <laughs> Judas. We don't talk about Bruno. There's a, the 11th guy. There's 11 left. Okay? There's 11 guys who knew Jesus better than anybody, who had spent thousands of hours with him. They are now with him back from the dead. And they're worshiping him, but the Bible says, some doubted. Some are like, I don't know. This is so wild. Like the idea, guys, that God would come to earth as a man. The incarnation, does it ever stop blowing your mind that God would love you so much that he would come to this earth and he would meet you where you are in the form? He would put on human flesh to live and, and, and be human so that we would trust him and know him and then to die for us and then to come back to life. I mean, does it ever stop blowing your mind that God would love you that much? And everybody who's getting baptized today, they're, they're saying, hey, I'm identifying with the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And just like Jesus publicly died on a cross for me, I am publicly announcing to the world that the old me is gone and the new me is here and I'm gonna live a life for him. That's what's happening today with baptisms and I'm so excited. But think about, think about, think about the disciples around Jesus. They're worshiping him and it says like his feet are like leaving the ground. He's ascending, right? He's like, take it off. It's been real. I'm out, you guys. And he's about to, but some still doubted and the next line is this go into the world and make disciples come on say it with me say therefore go make disciples therefore go make disciples who did Jesus tell that to Jesus told that to 11 guys who were actually still doubting a little bit Jesus told doubters to go make disciples I don't know, it just really encourages me. <laughs> it really encourages me because I still doubt a lot of times. Anybody else? I still doubt. The idea that God would love me this much and what he says to be true is just so wild. It's just so inconceivable. It's just so nuts. I still doubt sometimes. And you know what? The longer I've been following Jesus, it's not that my doubts have gone away. It's just that my faith has gotten stronger than the doubts. And maybe you're here today and you need to be reminded that God hasn't called you because you believe everything perfectly. God has called you because he loves you and he trusts you. And if you will love him and you will trust him, your doubts will stay this big and your faith will get this big. 
you will, your, your faith will outgrow your doubt and you'll realize that God is who he says he is and everything he's called you to do, he's gonna help you with that, including this great commission that we talk about today. Therefore, go into the world and make disciples. I love the first one, therefore, because what Jesus is saying here is he's saying there is a reason. No book, no paragraph, no story starts off with therefore. I mean, that's always, there's always something that's happened. It's because of this, therefore, and I just, I just, do you have a therefore? I have a therefore. God has saved me from myself. Therefore, I will obey him until the ends of the earth. I will go. I will serve him. Do you have a therefore? Do you ha has God done something in your life that compels you to now obey him and to serve him? Because this vision that he has of us making disciples, it's just, it's just beautiful, but it can be intimidating. It can be intimidating to think that God has a plan for your life that includes you helping and serving other people. It includes you being a mentor to somebody and helping them. But if you think about it, it's one of the only ways that God cannot waste the pain and the hard things that we've gone through. Because, you know, my life has been up and down. How about you? My life was up and down before I met Jesus. But, you know, when life goes up, life goes down, what I've noticed in the bad times, these become testimonies of how good God has been to me. And I'm able to take, when I make a disciple, when I, when I help people along the way in their faith, I'm able to say, you know what, I've been where you've been. I've experienced that pain, you know? And you know what? God did something in my life in that moment, and he pulled me out of that. And I can help you see that God is at work in your life, and he hasn't given up on you. And if God can do it for me, he could do it for you. That's what discipleship is, to say, you know what, I know what it's like when your parents go through a divorce, because my parents went through a divorce. I know what happened. I know what it's like to have a broken heart, because I was also broken up with. I know what it's like to try to get a job, and, and, and be trying to get a job, and trying to find a job, but can't find one, and feeling like God's not going to come through, but then God comes through. I know what it's like to, 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 to lose it all financially. I know what it's like to be sick, and to not know when you're going to get better, and have to trust God to heal you. I know what it's like. I know what it's like. I know what it's like. I've been there, and you know what I've learned? That God is good in every one of those seasons, even though we fail, even though life seems to get harder, even though we struggle, that doesn't change who he is. He is faithful, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. Man, to make disciples is not to waste the pain that you've gone through in life, and to be able to say, you know what, let me help you along the way. And that's what Jesus says to do. He says, there, go for it. Uh, go for it. Therefore, go and make disciples. Take, an, take people along on this journey with you. Man, I need you to be mentors and big brothers and big sisters, big sisters to help people along the way. And that's how a family works. And I want to talk about what that means to have a church family. And I want, I want you to have a vision for, for your life actually making a difference and being bigger than yourself, because you know what? There was a day you came through these doors and you just said, God, if you'll just be at work in my life, but I'm here to tell you, God doesn't wanna just work in your life, he wants to work through your life. He wants to work through your life. He, do, he wants your life to matter to his plan, and that is called discipleship. That is called discipleship. And it may seem like a big, a big thing to undertake, but we're gonna talk about the different stages in your development as a Christian, because here's the thing, you have a physical age because you were born so many years ago but you have a spiritual age because you were born again as well and a physical age has stages and but so does a spiritual age when you're born again you go through stages in life and i i want to help you see today where you are in your spiritual age so that you know how to grow so you can head toward this great vision of being somebody who makes disciples and obeys the great commission that god has given all of us can i get a witness Today, God is going to give you a vision for how he sees you and how he wants you to grow so that you can grow into the great plan that he has for your life. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay. When you are born again, just like when you are physically born, you, there is a time before you are born. Okay? There is a time before you were a Christian. There was a time before somebody decided to get baptized. They were not born yet. So write down this for the first one, not yet born. Okay? The Bible teaches that we are born into the image of God, meaning that we are born an image bearer of God, but the Bible does not teach that we are born a child of God. 
Because a child of God is a relationship with God as a father. And here's what you realize when you think about it. God has never stopped being a father, and he's always seen you as his child. He wants to be your father. But the thing is, is that he has given us free will to choose if God will be our father or not. So, so, so before we are born again, we are deciding if we're going to worship God. We're deciding if we're going to be born again. And we're sinners, and we need a way to get to the Father. And Jesus says there is a way to get to him, and there's only one way. You know what it is? He says, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus makes it possible for you to be born again into the family of God and be a son or daughter of the Father. So if you want to be in the family of God, you want to be born again, you have to come through Jesus. But there's a time before Jesus when you're just like, I don't know about this Jesus guy. I don't know if he's the only way. I don't know. And that, that is the not yet born stage. There are people here in this room and watching online and all throughout today who that's the stage you're in. You're just like, I don't know if Jesus is who he says he is. Maybe he's just a wise man. Maybe he's just a, a, you know, a really good teacher. Maybe he has something to offer me and he can give me some advice. But you're not willing to go so far as to say, Wow, he is the Holy One of God who came for me, who lived for me, who died for me, who rose for me. I mean, that's just like, wow. But you, you say things like this. If you're not yet born, you say things like this. I'm, I'm, I'm spiritual. I don't like labels. I, like label, I don't like labels. Just call me spiritual. And I saw somebody the other day, and they had a shirt on that said spiritual gangsta. And I was like, spiritual gangsta? And I was like, what kind of spirits are we talking about here? Because I know of one life-giving spirit. That's it, the Holy Spirit. And when you're born again, you are possessed by that spirit. I believe in possession. Anybody else? I, I am possessed by the Holy Spirit. He lives in me. He brought me to life. His spirit is in me. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you if you're born again. You have a life-giving spirit. You're not just forgiven by God when you're born again. You are filled with his spirit to overcome the challenges and do everything he's called you to do. You have the power of God available in you and this relationship. I believe in a miracle work in God. Are you with me? I've seen some incredible things, and I know that all comes down to being possessed by the Holy Spirit. But some people are like, I don't want to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. I, want to, I don't like labels. I don't like labels. I just, just call me spiritual. And you know what? Hey, I'm glad you're here. I'm totally glad you're here, and I have a lot of friends who feel this exact same way. But there will come a day, if you keep coming to church here and you, and you keep listening to God's word, there will come a day where you go, you know what? I can't deny it anymore. God's been working in my life, and he's inviting me, and he's calling me, and I know it's time to get baptized. And when you get baptized, you're telling everybody, hey, I'm not, it's, I'm not, I'm not in the not yet phase anymore. I'm in the born again phase, and I want everybody to know that Jesus is my Savior, and I'm going to follow him, and I'm a child of God. That's why everybody getting baptized is saying they're saying goodbye to the old life. Let's go to the new life. That's what they're saying. And so I'm so excited that you're making that decision today. If you're not yet born, we're all excited for you. None of us regret giving our life to Jesus. It's the best thing we've ever done. And it only gets better. And, and is it hard? Yes. But will he give you everything you need? Yes. Is it hard? Yes. Is it worth it? 100%. And, 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 and if you're in that not yet phase and you're here today, Maybe today's the day where you go, you know what? Forget it. I'm doing it. I'm giving my life to Jesus. <laughs> Maybe today's you're like, you know what? What have I been holding back from? Like, why have I been waiting to get baptized? You know, if you don't want to get baptized, right, there's a number of reasons that it could be. But sometimes it's just, it's just you, there's just a little bit of your heart where you've just been holding back. Because, you know, once you do that, you're, you're, you know, you're serious about this thing. You know, you're really going for it. And I just, my prayer is that even if you came today and you weren't planning on get baptized, maybe there would be some of you who are just like, you know what? I don't, you, you drew a line in the sand out there, you know? You said you're either for me or you're against me. Well, Jesus is the one who said that, right? I, I just pray that maybe some people today say, you know what, I'm, I'm going all in and I'm gonna do it. And I, I wanna make sure we have everything that we have to help you here today. And we got two baptism tanks out there because people have been like spontaneously, they did, I didn't know today was baptisms. I've been waiting for this day, you know? So today is the day. I think a lot of people are just gonna say, you know what? I don't wanna identify as not yet born again. Put a label on me. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. I've been saved by the grace of God. Man, I am possessed by the Holy Spirit. I may not be perfect, but man, I'm a work in progress, and by God's grace, I'm gonna live a life that glorifies and worships him. Put a label on me, put a jersey on me. I wanna be on the team. I'm on team Jesus now. I'm in the kingdom of God. He's my king. 
I'm a child of God. I'm a son, a daughter of God. Yeah, yeah, before you're a Christian, you know, you're not yet born, you don't love labels, but once you are a Christian, you couldn't be more proud of being adopted and chosen by God. Yeah, so not yet born is definitely a category. And people who are not yet born, they say, don't put a label on me, I'm just spiritual. The next phase that happens when you go into uh, your, your, your maturity as a Christian, you go from being not yet born to being born. What do, what do, what do, what do you sound like when you're born, when you're, when you're newly born again? What do you sound like when you're in that stage? Well, you're a baby in the Lord. What do babies sound like? Wah, wah, right? And I love babies. I love babies. I love Christian babies. I love that we have a church family with all different maturity levels and lots of babies. We're going to have 50 babies today getting baptized. I love it. I love it. I love when you cry. I love when you cry. I love when you make a mess around here. I love when all of our leaders are changing your diapers. I love, I love babies. Um, and God loves babies. But here's the thing. Babies say things like this. Well, don't all roads lead to heaven? Don't all roads lead to heaven? You're a baby. You're just learning. You're learning that there's nobody else other than Jesus who saves. You're learning that all these other things that, you know, that, that, that people promise or the world promises is going to give you life is not, is not true. That that will fail you. That only Jesus, only Jesus is the one, that, the rock that you can stand. You know, you, you, babies say things like, 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 is, is, how do I know the word of God is true? And, and maybe this is just written by man and not written by God. You, you say things that are really good questions that baby, babies should be asking because this is the foundational time of your faith. In fact, in fact G, uh, Peter says this in 1 Peter 2.2. 2, he says, like newborn babies <laughs> crave pure spiritual milk. This is what the Bible says. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Come on, elbow your neighbor and say, grow up in your salvation. Grow up in your salvation. Grow up in your salvation. I love it because Peter wants you to know that salvation is not a one-time event. It's not just a destination going to heaven. I know people who think their salvation means, you know what, I'm saved. I've got fire insurance. I know where I'm going and I'm safe. What does he say? Grow up in your salvation because salvation is not a destination. It's not a one-time event. It's a relationship with a living God. We were saved. We are saved. We will be saved. Grow up in your salvation. Mature. You were not yet born. Now you're born again. Bah, bah, make it a mess. You're going to grow, right? I keep saying bah like you're a lamb. I think that makes more sense. <laughs> we're all lambs. Bah, right? How do you grow up? How do you go from being an infant, a baby in the Lord? How do you go into the next stage? How do you grow? Well, Peter says, you need spiritual milk. You need the word of God. You need to learn what the Bible says about who you are in Christ. You need to learn. You need to receive. You need nourishment. And that comes from what Jesus calls your daily bread. You need to eat. You need to learn through the Bible. You need to learn through God's word who you are so that you can grow. You need nourishment. Like babies, he says, who crave spiritual milk. And so if you're not yet born again, you say things like, I don't like a label, I'm just spiritual. And if you're a baby, you know, what you, really what you need to grow is, 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 is the word of God. So, okay, how do I say this? I'm, okay, I've been trying, I don't want to offend anybody unnecessarily, but the truth is, is that, um, you know, the truth is, is that if you don't read the word of God on your own, if you don't, if you don't know, if you don't read the Bible on your own, you don't seek God on your own, and you're, you know, you just come to church once a week or three or four, three, three times a month, right? You just, you just come to church, and the only time you're learning the word of God is when I'm teaching it to you. I just want you to know, I see you, and the Bible would teach that you're a baby, I don't want that to offend you because I love that you're here, but, but you know, you're, you're a baby, and, and I'm your daddy bird, <laughs> and, I do, and I study the word of God, and I eat it, <laughs> and then you come in, and then I go, oh, little baby, and I go, <laughs> and, I, and I regurgitate it into your little baby mouth, and you're like, nah, daddy bird, and I'm like, <laughs> and then you eat, and you're like, oh, it feels so good. I haven't eaten in seven days, and then you, you I'm going to go to, I'm going to, little baby bird to work, and I go, bye, little baby bird, 
And, and then you come back, and I see you next week, and you're like, Pastor, it was the hardest week. You'd never believe what happened to me. And oh my gosh, the devil was attacking me, and this person at work did this, and this is going on. And I'm like, man, you look famished. You look weak right now. Come here, come here, little baby bird. And then you eat it, and you're like, oh, I feel so good. I feel so much stronger now. And I go to work. <laughs> and then one day you're like, I wonder if I could learn to eat by myself so I could be strong every day. And you're like, oh, man. Have I ever told you about when I got discipled for the first time? Like, I had gone to church, but I didn't read the Bible on my own. And uh, I was about 20 years old, and Pastor Rudy pulled me into his office, and uh, he was going to disciple me. And I was, so, I was so excited that he was going to disciple me. And some of you are like, well, Justice, why don't you pull me into your office, and, and you disciple me? And the answer is, you're not, you're not dating my daughter. <laughs> but I was dating his daughter, so that's probably why he was motivated to make sure that I was mature. And, uh, and, and so I was so excited to meet with him. And I remember the first time I met with him, uh, I was like 15 minutes late. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I, would, I had driven from college. I had to borrow somebody's car. And I get there and I meet with him. And he looks at me like, you know, being late is the worst thing in the world. I'm a 20-year-old kid. I'm late to everything, right? And he looks at me. And the first thing he said, he's just like, you know, if you're ever late again, this is never going to work, you know? And I'm like, dang, man, you know? But it was a different kind of relationship. It was a father in the faith who was helping me grow, right? So I kind of had to decide how I was going to hear that and how I was going to receive that, you know? And so when I heard that, I was like, okay, you're right. I won't be late again. And then he's like, well, what questions do you have for me? And then I was kind of like, well, I thought you were going to just, like, train me, you know? I thought you were just going to in my mouth. And I thought that that was how it was going to work. And, and uh, he's like, no, 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 no. no you're, you, you, you are literally in Bible college justice. Like, you know, the, like, you, you have your own Bible, like, your own copy of the Bible, right? Like, yeah. And he's like, so what are your questions for me? And I was like, oh, okay, well, I have a question about this. And he goes, okay, cool. What's the word of God say? And I, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. You're supposed to tell me the answers. And he goes, well, go home and read the Bible and learn it and then come back and I'll help you with it. And I was like, this is not what I thought this was going to be. You know? But what was he doing? Pastor Rudy was growing me up. He was teaching me to go to the word for myself. He was teaching me how to feed myself. The next week I met with him, exact same thing happened. Pastor Rudy, what do you think about this? Well, it doesn't really matter what I think about it. It matters what the word of God says. What does the word of God say, Justice? Well, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. We'll go read the Bible and come back, and we'll talk about that next week. Well, man, this is a little bit more challenging. This is requiring responsibility for my man. Do you guys see what he was doing there? He helped me understand how to feed myself. I'm so glad that's in the foundation of how he discipled me because it helped me grow from being a baby into being a child. That's the third phase. You go from not yet born, born again, to a baby, to being a child. If you're not yet born, get saved today. Amen? Get baptized today. If you're a baby, start eating of the word of God. You need spiritual milk. I will be your daddy bird as long as you need. It's my honor. But I want you to grow up, and so does God. Amen? God wants you to grow up, okay? Put your big bird pants on. That's funny. I made that up right now. Put your big bird pants on. Mm. Wish I would have thought of that at the 830 service. Okay. <laughs> next, the next thing is a child. You know, babies say, well, help me. You know, uh, uh, ch ch what do children say? What do children say? What, do, what, do, what does your child say if you're a parent? Or what, did you, what was the kind of stuff you did when you were a kid? Well, I love what uh, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. I'm sure you've heard this verse before. When I was a child... I spoke and I thought and I reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Right? What's he saying? He's saying like, as we grow up, we stop acting like a child and we start maturing. And then you go, well, aren't all of us a child of God? Aren't we supposed to be a child of God? Hey, there's a difference between being childlike and being immature. Childlike is about humility. It's about a posture that sees God as your father. But immature has everything to do with how you obey God. Christian maturity is not how much you know about the Bible. It's how much you apply God's word to your life. A lot of people know a lot about the Bible and don't do it. Are they immature or mature? 
And sometimes people ask me all the time. They go, hey, I need you to, you, why don't you teach on this subject? Or why don't you teach on that subject? And I'm like, why don't you just apply what you've already learned to your life? And Because, you know, if we can be honest, a lot of us in this room, maybe all of us, we know more about the Bible than we've actually applied to our life. We know more about what God says than we actually are obeying. Some of us are educated beyond our own maturity in faith. So, 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 so a child, they say things like what? What are the things that they say? How do I know if you're a child? That sounds so judgmental me saying this, but how do I know that you, you know, are a child in your faith? How do I know? But you say things to me, you know, like, well, you know what? Um, I'm here today because uh, I made a deal with God. <laughs> I hear all the time. Children say this, God, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. I hear all the time. Yeah, I'm at church because, you know, I promised God if he just gets me out of this situation, I go to church every day, every week. I wouldn't miss it. Some of you are here today because you were in deep last night, huh? And you made a deal with God. God, if you just bail me out, if you just get me out of this situation, if you just get me home safe tonight, Lord, if you just get me home safe, uh, I will go to church tomorrow. You made a deal with God. And then you got here and you saw that it was communion. You're like, oh, thank God. I need something to drink. Give me that grape juice. Because you just got caught, mom. You, just, you took 30 grape juices and I'm glad you need it. You need, you're dehydrated. You need to hydrate, Okay. Uh, I'm glad that you're here. Take as much communion as you want. Um, but here's the truth is that you're only here because you made a deal with God. And you know what? I don't think God is tripping that much. I think that he loves you and I think he recognizes that you're a child. But you know what? It's very childish to make deals with God. Maturity is to realize that God has already given us the one and only deal that we should ever need which is to be forgiven of all the awful things that we've done. And in exchange, you know, Jesus is the deal. I'll give you Jesus in exchange for your awful, wicked life. I'll give you my perfect son. Here's the deal. I'll give you my perfect son for your awful, wicked life. You want the deal? You want to trade? He'll give you his perfect life if you give me your broken life. He'll give you his spirit if you give me your sin. I mean, that's a pretty good deal. You know, it, it, it's very childish. You know, children, they, 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 they throw temper tantrums. They, they, they blame God. They get angry at God at everything, right? And, and they, 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 they just don't have that revelation of all that's been done for them. But as you grow, uh, you realize how good God is and you stop judging him. See, it's very childish to judge God. Our job is not to judge God. It's God's job to judge us. And what happens is, is when you're a child, you start thinking you, you know, well, why aren't you doing what I want, God? And you said you were going to do this. It's like, dude, God never said he was going to do this. And that was never the plan. You just have, you have just, you have just assumed these things about God because you don't know him. But as you grow up, you get to know who he is and you trust him. Are you with me on this? When you're a child, you, you come to church and you worship God and, and you worship him and you go, I'm going to sing these songs to you because you're going to bless me. I'm going to worship you because... If I worship you, you're going to bless me. I'm going to be a good person so that you bless me. And maybe if I worship you and I lift my hands, you give me a promotion at my job. Or maybe if I serve you, you'll, that girl who I DM'd will answer me. Or may, may, maybe if I, if I do these things for you, you will do these things for me. Let's make a deal, God. I'll, I'll serve you if you do these things for me. When God has already served you, he's already served me more than we could ever earn back. We could never deserve what he's already done. It's immature to worship God for what he's going to do. Maturity is realizing that we worship God because of what he has already done. Our life is a response to what God has already done. Jesus is more than enough. We are complete. And we worship God in response to that. Yeah, a mature Christian, they get out of the child phase by serving. Children are selfish and they, they come to church for themselves and their faith is about themselves and God wants you to grow out of that and be of service. This is the height of Christian maturity. Serving and getting better and better at it. Jesus, the last thing he did the last thing he did before he died, before he gave his life, was get on his knees and wash the feet of his disciples. 
And one of them was named Judas. And he knew he was going to betray him. And he still served him. That is what Christian maturity looks like. Serving people, not because of who they are, but because who God has been to you. Christian maturity is not saying, this is how much I love God. It's saying, this is how much I love Judas. To lay your life down for somebody else. Not because what you get in return, but because of the one who's already laid his life down for you. That's what we want to be. We want to be servants. And children have a really hard time with that because you're selfish. And I want you to grow out of that. And you just got to, you got to practice it. You got to train in it, right? My, 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 my I, had, I did some yard work at my house yesterday. And I told my son, you know, before I went to bed, I said, hey, I'm going to get you up at 7 in the morning and we're going to do yard work tomorrow in the house. And, uh, you know, I got him up and he had a good attitude about it. And his little brother even joined in and they were doing that. And, and it's so funny how we got to the end of the day and they just felt like they, you know what I mean? They're just like, man, that was so hard. Like, man. And I was like, bro, you, I literally said this. I said, you picked up oranges and put them off the ground and put them in a trash sack. Like, can you not exaggerate how hard you were working? Like, let's not act like I'm a slave driver. I'm not a pharaoh over here, okay? You picked up trash in the backyard. You know what I mean? You didn't even use tools. Like, it wasn't that bad, you know? And, and anybody else have a dad who woke them up every Saturday morning and put them to work? And if you didn't get up and go to work, your dad snapped that belt and just threatened to spank you? Any else have, anybody else have good dads? Yeah. So, so I'm, nerd, I'm teaching them. But their, their perspective, their experience... Their perception is reality. Like, man, that was the hardest day's work of my life. <laughs> and I'm like, all you did was like put stuff in a trash can. Um, but that's how it is in our faith too, is that we need, we need practice being unselfish, right? And serving others. And so, you know, I think about our parking team that's out there and somebody, did somebody left a Yelp review about like our parking team or something? And I swear, dude, give me their address. I'm gonna TP their house. I will TP their house, okay? Because our parking team, dude, those guys are out there for three or four services, and it's a nightmare out there, and they're putting up with people who've had a bad week, <laughs> and they are finding parking spots for people. Can we give it for our parking team? Like, dude, they're out there. Like, I think I love the parking team because, and I'll never forget the day I pulled into church as a 10-year-old kid with my parents, with my mom, and my dad was wearing one of those vests, and he, and he was parking cars. And I saw my dad on the parking team, and I was like, oh, that's what manhood looks like, somebody who serves God. So I just love the parking team because they're unappreciated. I love you guys. I love you guys so much. And thank you for serving. I know you don't get all the recognition, but hey, if it wasn't for you, we would be, you know, it would be, everybody would be coming in here with really bad attitudes, and you do what you can. And um, Pastor Rudy did the same thing with me when he discipled me. After I started learning the word of God on my own, he's like, you need to serve. And he made me uh, vacuum the church, right? And that's why this church doesn't have carpet because I never want to vacuum a church again. Uh, I had to vacuum the church. Uh, and then he wanted me to clean the bathrooms, the toilets. And for years, I vacuumed the church twice a week and I cleaned the toilets. And um, I was 20 years old and I was doing that. And you know what I'm gonna tell you right now? I loved it. I loved every second of it because it's so great to serve God. It's so great to serve God in the dark when nobody sees. It's so great to do something for God that's in private. And I just served him, and I loved it. And he spoke to me when I was vacuuming that hideous red carpet. He just, he spoke to me when I was going in around those pews. You know what I mean? I hate pews. <laughs> he spoke to me when I was cleaning the, the, the bathrooms. Because, I, I, you know, you're in a different posture when you serve God. You're more, you hear God more. The Lord told me this the other day. He goes, it's really hard to think about other people and think about yourself at the same time. And serving kind of puts you in that position to hear better from God. So let me just walk you through this as we end. Maybe you're not born again yet. Get saved today, please. You won't regret it. Uh, number two, maybe, maybe you're a baby. Start eating the spiritual milk. Start eating for yourself. Read the word of God. Decide today that you're not going to miss a day. You're going to read the Bible every day, just a little bit. You know. Or maybe you're a child. Start serving in some way. Get your mind off yourself it's going to feel really hard at first, but you're going to get used to serving and you're going to love it and you're going to realize that your life can make a difference. Or maybe you're a teenager 
Any teenagers in the faith? Any teenagers in the family of God? I'll go ahead and play my cards here. I'll show you my cards. I think 90% of the body of Christ is teenagers. And here's why. Here's why I think that. Because Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For even if you were to have 10,000 teachers to guide you, you would, yet you would only have, you would not have many fathers. Even though you have all these teachers, fathers in the faith is rare. Fathers who led you to Christ and assume responsibility for you. For I became your father in Christ through the good news of salvation. He says, uh, he says, the difference between going from a teenager into like a young adult or real maturity, thinking for yourself, really discovering the call of God on your life, really walking in your purpose is a father who is able to help you mature. And I think the reason why we have so many teenagers in the family of God is because we have a lot of Christians who do not want to have authority in their life because we live in a world that has taught you that authority can't be trusted. But I'm telling you that authority doesn't come from me or any other Christian leaders here. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. You know what he says? He says, do it. He told 11 doubters, go make disciples. He didn't ask them if they wanted to do it. He commanded them to do it. Go make disciples. Because sometimes, we have to trust God even when we don't feel it. But after we obey him and we get down the road a little bit, we look back and we go, oh, I think I can see a little bit more clearly. That's why you wanted me to do this. I didn't understand it at the time, but I'm sure glad I trusted you because I'm better for it and so is everybody else. And the Lord would tell some of you today, like, you don't want Christian, you don't want authority in your life and you're dragging that in from the world. But in the family of God, you need a father in the faith. You need big brothers or big sisters or moms in the faith. This is a family. I love babies. I love chi uh, children. I love teenagers. But if we don't have some fathers in the faith, we're not going to mature around here. So I just want to say thank you to all the life group leaders who served semester in and semester out. If it wasn't for you opening up your home and bringing people into your life. Yesterday I was talking to a friend who goes to our church and he's like, what can I do more for the church? It's changed my life so much. What can I do? And I said, bro, you already lead a life group. And I, don't, I told him, I don't do a good enough job thanking the life group leaders because the life group and team leaders are the ones that bring people right off the street right from growth track. The broken, the hurting, the lonely, the confused, the, the, the wounded. And what you need is you need good friends around you because I'm telling you, teenagers, listen up if you're a teenager. Every parent will tell you, the game changer for a teenager, who their friends are. Who their friends are. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future fathers in the faith, mothers in the faith, they realize that and they go, let me help you be in a group. Let me lead a group so that I can get friends around you so that you can get the authority of God's word and you can get good friends going in the right direction so that you can have more people pulling you into a new future than reminding you of your past. And that's what fathers and mothers do in the faith. They bring they bring the right people around. They help disciple you in groups. Jesus made disciples in groups. You know why? Because Peter didn't just need Jesus. Peter needed James and John. He had them together. He commanded us to make disciples in groups, and that's why we have life groups. And I want to put up on the screen just a QR code because I just wonder if there's anybody inspired today and you're just like, you know what, I want to grow up. I want to grow up. And here's what I would say. I would say go through our leaders track and apprentice with one of our life group leaders next semester so that you can kind of learn how to make disciples with them. And you know what? Maybe you're not ready yet, but once you begin this process of training with them, you're going to get ready and you're going to get stronger and you're going to get to a place where you can obey the great commission that God has given us to actually pass on what he's taught us into the lives of other people, which is called discipleship. And before long, you'll be out there and you'll be baptizing people in that group and you'll be fulfilling what God's called you to do. God's got a vision for for your life and I hope you can see you may have started over here but before long you'll be over here if you just keep giving if you just keep giving it giving it you keep serving you keep going a lot you will turn around one day and you'll go like, wow I'm not where I want to be but I'm not where I used to be 
Look at how far I've come. Hey, will you stand to your feet? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, today, just, today, just, what if today was the day? What if today was today? Like, what if, what if, what if I'm talking to somebody, you've been holding your heart back for a really long time, and you just haven't been like, you know, you're like, you know what? I just, I've been like, I need to be really sure. I need to be really sure. I need to be like 100% sure, or I can't do it. Because I'm an all-in, I'm an all-out kind of guy, and I need to be 100% sure. And I just want to remind you that Jesus told 11, 11 doubters to go make disciples. Jesus isn't looking for somebody who's 100% confident. He's looking for somebody who will trust him. He's looking for somebody to say, you know what? If this is true, then yes, I will receive your son. And then go prove it to him by making the changes in your life of repentance that he will help you do with the Holy Spirit. If you want to begin a relationship with Jesus today, if you want to be close to God because he forgives you of what you've done, he fills you, he possesses you with the Holy Spirit so you can move forward, I just want you to respond with this, saying, yes, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus today. Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? Just for the, just for the a privacy of a moment like this, who would say, you know what? Today's the day. Today's the day I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to say I'm sorry for what I've done. I want to receive forgiveness, and I want to walk into that new life. I want to be born again. I want to begin today. Would you just raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Raise your hand wherever you're at in this room. I see your hand back there, and your hand right there, and your hand right there, and your hand, yes, and your hand, yes, and your hand, yes, and your hand, yes. Anybody over here, just wave me down if you want to give your life to Jesus today. Awesome. In your hand, yes. In your hand, yes. Anybody else? Awesome. 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 Will you pray this prayer with me? Would you say, Father, thank you for your son, for forgiveness, for new life. Will you fill me with the Holy Spirit so I can live this week honoring you in all that I do? In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. And if today you decided to make that first time decision, to follow Jesus, I want you to do me a favor and text BELIEVE to the number on the screen or scan that QR code. We'd love to connect and celebrate with you. And speaking of that, we actually have a resource we would love to send you. If you need a Bible, text BIBLE to the number on the screen. We would love to send that to you to help you on your faith journey. And last but not least, if God's been moving in your heart and in your life and you're looking to give, there's two ways for you to make that happen. You can text FREEDOM CHURCH, all one word, to the number 77977 or head on over to freedom.church slash give. Thank you again, and we can't wait to see you next time.